Hello friends. The topic for our study this quarter is titled How to Follow Jesus in Trying Times. And we'll be focusing on the book of Ephesians, a letter Paul wrote when he was in prison. Paul has a profound purpose that motivates this letter, partly because of his imprisonment and partly because of ongoing persecution and temptations, the Ephesians are tempted to lose heart. Paul reminds them of what happened when they were converted, accepting Christ as their savior and becoming part of the church. They have become Christ's body, the building materials in a temple, the bride of Christ, and a well-equipped army. They play a strategic role in fulfilling God's grand plan to unite everything in Christ. Paul writes to awaken the believers in Ephesus to their full identity and privileges as followers of Christ. And I'm quite sure this is something we all need to focus on, especially these last days. Before we could get into the study, let us all pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us. Especially we thank you for this book on Ephesians. We thank you, Father, for, for giving us an opportunity where we are able to read this letter. Dear God, <coughs> as we get into this study, we pray that you will be with us too. Holy Spirit will be there with us and talk to each one of us personally. Father, help us to take this letter as it is written to each one of us personally. We humbly ask for your Holy Spirit's guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll be looking at the life of Paul as to what his motivation and what his uh, what his aim was for the people of Ephesians and what mindset he had. Paul was a living example of what every true Christian should be. He lived for the God, glory of God. His words come sounding down the line to our time. For to me to live is Christ. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He who was once a persecutor of Christ in the person of his saints now holds up before the world the cross of Christ. Paul's heart burned with a love for souls and he gave all his energies for the conversions of men. There never lived a more self denying earnest, persevering worker. His life was Christ. He worked the works of Christ. All the blessings he received were prized has so many advantages to be used in blessing others. From the Bible Commentary, Volume 6, Paragraph 1112. How were the people of Ephesians? At times, especially we who are living in India, in a place where there's so much of heathen worships, worship, so much of pagan worship, sometimes we're so confused how we can approach let us look into how the city of Ephesus was. It was not easy for Paul either to found Christianity there. Ephesus was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire with a population of about 250,000. It was the capital of one of the empire's richest provinces, provinces, the province of Asia, which covered much of what we know today as Asia Minor. In Paul's day, the province was enjoying a time of growth and prosperity. A port city, Ephesus, was also at the crossroads of important land routes. While the people worshipped many deities in the city, Artemis, regarded as the protector goddess of the city, was supreme. Her worship was the focus of civic ceremonies, athletic games, and annual celebrations. Paul's first journey to Ephesus was brief. And he came, we see this from Acts chapter uh, 19, where it, Acts chapter 20, where it says, he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
When they asked him to stay longer with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. Paul later returns to Ephesus and remains there for three years. The apostle makes a significant time commitment to Ephesus with the intention of firmly founding Christianity there. As Paul was brought in direct contact with the idolatrous inhabitants of Ephesus, the power of God was strikingly displayed through him. The apostles were not always able to work miracles at will. The Lord granted his servants this special power as the progress for his cause or the honor of his name required. Like Moses and Aaron at the court of Pharaoh, the apostle had now to maintain the truth against the lying wonders of the magicians. Hence, the miracles he wrought were of a different character from those which he had heretofore performed. So the scripture declares that the Lord wrought miracles by the hand of Paul and that the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and not the name of Paul. This is a quotation that was read from the sketches from the life of Paul, paragraph 135. Another quotation from Acts of the Apostles, paragraph 286 says, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. These manifestations of supernatural power were far more potent than had ever before been witnessed in Ephesus, and were of such a character that they could not be imitated by the skill of the juggler or the enchantments of the sorcerer. As these miracles were wrought in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the people had opportunity to see that God of heaven was more powerful than the magicians who were worshippers of the goddess Diana or Artemis. Thus, the Lord exalted his servant even before the idolaters themselves, immeasurably above the most powerful and favored of the magicians. Let us look into some of the events which took place in Ephesus, which was life-changing for the people there, and where God's name was glorified. And also, let us see what lessons we can learn from them. We would have heard about the event of burning the books on magic in Acts chapter 19 and verse 19. The study says, the author says that, the sum of whatever was stated there when they, I think 50,000 pieces of silver, it would have come down to $5 million uh, is what they say. And people burned these books. I would like to read a quotation from Acts of the Apostles, paragraph 288 and 289, which says, by burning their books on magic, the Ephesian converts showed that the things in which they had once delighted, they love a word. It was by and through magic that they had especially offended God and imperiled their souls. And it was against magic that they showed such indignation. Friends, they were cut off from the sinful past. And we too are called to do the same when we want to be truly converted. We need to categorically refuse and reject any trace of idolatry and witchcraft in our homes and properties. By retaining these books, the disciples would have exposed themselves to temptation. By selling them, they would have placed temptation in the way of others. They had renounced the kingdom of darkness and to destroy its power, they did not hesitate at any sacrifice. Thus, truth triumphed over men's prejudices and their love of humanity. They could have sold the books and earned money, but they burned it. They, the, the love for God was supreme in their hearts than the love for money. By this manifestation of the power of Christ, a mighty victory for Christianity was gained in the very stronghold of superstition. 
the influence of what had taken place was more widespread than even Paul realized. From Ephesus, the news was widely circulated and a strong impetus was given to the cause of Christ. Long after the apostle himself had finished his course, these scenes lived in the memory of men and were the means of winning converts to the gospel. Another event that we can see is where some Jewish people tried sorcery in the name of Jesus. And what happened to them? The one to whom all the spirits of evil are subject and were given his servants authority over them was about to bring still greater shame and defeat upon those who despised and profaned his own name. Sorcery had been prohibited by the Mosaic law on pain of death, yet from time to time it had been secretly practiced by apostate Jews. At the time of Paul's visit to Ephesus, they were in the city certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, who seeing the wonders wrought by him, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. An attempt was made by seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and the chief of the priests. Finding a man possessed with a demon, they addressed him, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. But the evil spirit answered, them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Thus, unmistakable proof was given of the sacredness of the name of Christ and the peril that they incurred who should, who should invoke it without faith in the divinity of serious mission. Fear fell on them all. The name of the Lord Jesus was again magnified. In Acts chapter 19, verse 21, we see another event where the where people, especially the, the ones who make the idols, they wanted to get rid of God. Paul's witness in the large, sophisticated city of Ephesus was so effective that it impacted an important economic engine for the city. Tourism focused on the temple Artemis. And what temple it was, this magnificent structure was composed partly of 127 pillars, each 60 feet high, of Parian marble, pure white, flawless marble, highly prized for sculptures. 36 of these pillars were sculpted and overlaid with gold, earning the temple its reputation as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Concerned that Paul's anti-idolatry rhetoric was draining financial support from the temple, Demetrius, the silversmith, whipped his fellow craftsmen into a frenzy. A rapidly expanding and highly energized crowd swept from the marketplace into the large amphitheater, which seated some 25,000 people. There, the commotion continued, featuring two continuous hours of shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, a rapidly expanding and highly energized crowd. The decision of the recorder and of others holding honorable offices in the city had set Paul before the people as one innocent of any unlawful act. This was another triumph of Christianity over error and superstition. God had raised up the magistrate to vindicate his feet, his apostle, and hold the tumultuous mob in check. Paul's heart was filled with gratitude to God that his life had been preserved and that Christianity had not been brought into dispute by the tumult at Ephesus. We read these from Acts of the Apostles, paragraph 290. What can we learn from this? I'd like to read a quotation from God's Amazing Grace, paragraph 272. We may have an influence, a powerful influence in the world, we are to have nine single to the glory of God. We are to work with 
all the intelligence that God has given us, placing ourselves in the channel of light, that the grace of God can come upon us to mold and fashion us to the divine energy. Heaven is waiting to bestow its richest blessings, just as how it did on oil and upon all the events that took place. Heaven is waiting to bestow its richest blessings upon those who will consecrate themselves to do work of God in these last days of the world's history. Another quotation from Reflecting Christ, paragraph 245 says, Paul, as well as laboring publicly, went from house to house, preaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He met with men at their homes and besought them with tears, declaring unto them the whole counsel of God. Jesus came in personal contact with men. He did not stand aloof and apart from those who needed his help. We must come close to the hearts of those who need our ministry. We must open the Bible to the understanding, present the claims of God's law, read the promises to the hesitating, urge the backward, arouse the careless, strengthen the weak. Do not neglect speaking to your neighbors and doing them all the kindness in your heart. We need to seek for the spirit that constrained the apostle Paul to go from house to house, pleading with tears and teaching repentance to our God and faith to our God, Jesus Christ. We need to seek for this spirit. This is the history of Paul's mission in Ephesus. In the intervening years since Paul's departure, the Christian movement in Ephesus had grown and the number of houses of house churches had multiplied. Paul wrote Ephesians to be read aloud in the house churches of believers in greater Ephesus. Even though Paul was not able to visit them, his words were sounded through the letters, and he was not without advising them or counseling them. The subject of Ephesians is unity in Christ. This would necessitate unity of person, family, church, and race. The restoration of individual unity in the life of each believer assures unity of God's universe. It is not only the privilege, but the duty of every Christian to maintain a close union with Christ and to have a rich experience in the things of God. Then his life will be fruitful in good works. Said Christ, Herein is my father glorified that he bear much fruit, John 15, verse 8. The prophets and apostles did not perfect Christian character by miracle. They used the means which God had placed within their reach, and all who will put forth the same effort will secure the same risks. Such a wonderful promise. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul sets before them the mystery of the gospel, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and then assures them of his earnest prayers for their spiritual prosperity. What an assurance it would have been to the people then. God has acted in Christ to initiate his plan to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And he did so by creating the church as an entity composed of one new humanity of both Jews and Gentiles. Believers are called to act in concert with this divine plan, signaling to the evil powers that God's ultimate purpose is underway. As Ephesians 1.19 proclaims, the unity God has in mind is centered in Christ. Paul seeks to reignite the spiritual commitment of believers in Ephesus by reminding them that they are part of the church, which is at the heart of God's plan to unify all things in Christ. A principal strategy he uses is to talk about the church, and he does so using vivid metaphors, four of which he develops in some detail. And that is the church as a body, the church as a building or a temple, 
the church as a pride, and finally the church as an eye. Each one of these images in its own way reveals what God's purpose and intention for this church is. Friends, this is the need of the eye message. Unity is something we are all longing for, and only that can help us through these trying times. May we strive to be united with Christ always, because the restoration of individual unity in the life of each believer shows unity of God's universe. It absolutely for sure assures unity of God's church, which is very, very, very much needed for us as a church. May we strive to pray just as Paul prayed for his fellow believers. He assures his prayers for the spiritual restoration. May we pray for our neighbors, for our families, for our friends, for the spiritual life to be strengthened. Thank you for joining us, friends. And as we continue to study the book of Ephesians, may we put ourselves, may we go back and put ourselves in the place of the believers then who are truly converted and who are waiting for the counsel from God. And may we read these words as a type of counsel to us. And may we become more strengthened in our spiritual lives, become more strong. Let us close with a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful study that you have given us to our Dear God, we thank you for so many promises that you have. We thank you for those assurances that divine power will be there with us when your name is to be magnified and glorified. When we give ourselves totally to you, consecrate ourselves totally to you, that you will use us to glorify you. Father, we surrender ourselves into your hands. Teach us, train us, show us what it is completely empty out self so that we can be ready for you to use us. Just as Paul was a true Christian, Father, we want that name for us. We want to be true Christians. We want to hunger for souls. Put that in our hearts, Father and help us to be united in Christ. Help us to search our lives. And help us to bring in unity and harmony with the word of God and all that we say and think and do. So that, Father, they can be unity in family, in the church, and also at large among the nations and the races. Father God, help us to do all that we can so that our church, that we can help Church grow spiritually and also in us. Yes, all this in Jesus' name. Amen.